application. It's a lot to cover, and it's like 5 p.m. So it, you know, caching can be a very technical uh, 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 talk. And there's a lot of jargon; can be a bit dry. So I'm gonna take your attention with the first slide. Gotta catch them all, okay? So <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Um, oh, it's cut off. Okay, let me let me tune the. Um, uh, let me tune the yeah display a little bit. Let me try to see if I could hear the guy. Uh, arrangement is it? Arrangement? Yeah. Yeah. Is that? Yeah. Don't don't yeah. Just don't do that. And then I would shift this guy over, and then I would do this. I hope that will work. Really? Oh, yeah, I just lost my Wi-Fi. I don't see so. it's, oh, it's, it's, oh, okay, okay. There we go. Uh, let me make sure I'm there. Yep. Oh, yeah. So, these are the contents. I'll go through definition. How does it work? Um, why is it important? When to apply it? What to cache? Cache expiry, busting and validation, some common examples, and some myths. Okay? Now, Wikipedia has the definition. I won't bore you through all this, uh, but def uh, there's like page cache, web cache, DNS cache, database caching that is interesting. Here's more of a computer science definition a cache is basically just a high speed data store, right? But practical definition would be uh, using um, the use of previously stored computed results to shorten the time of processing a future request. That's basically the purpose of that, of caching. And caching is only effective if the retrieval of the stored result is faster than computing it. Right? Otherwise, it defeats the point. So how does it work? Well. Most caches uses a key value system, right? You pass it a key, it returns you the value. And the value usually is way larger than the key, so the key could be integer, email address, of some sort. And so in a typical transaction, you have an input request. An application that caches stuff will actually check if the request is already in, in the cache, right? If it's not, it's called a cache miss. You'll compute the results. Then write to cache. Thereafter, you actually set it out as a response. The next time round, you say, oh, it's in the cache. I'm going to just fetch it from the cache and shoot it out right away. OK, so why is it important? It actually increases perceived performance. Right? Uh, performance is a very, um, technically speaking, it's a very uh, uh, um, um, hard to define stuff. A lot of us, a lot of us look at like request response. And that's performance, right? But truly, performance is the number of instructions that the CPU runs. The only way to, to, to make it run faster is two ways. You buy a faster CPU or reduce your instruction set, right? There's, there's no way to increase performance. So you can actually increase perceived performance by having caching, right? Because that actually reduces the number of instructions that you need to run in your code. So it reduces the time to respond requests, definitely. It reduces cost for computing power, right? Um, it definitely will clear uh, application bottlenecks, allowing your web servers to process actually new requests instead of the same request over and over again, and offloading the, uh, the application I.O. to a faster storage. So when to apply caching? Well, obviously, when there's a bottleneck. When the output is the same for a high number of users, right? So let's say if you're on a shopping cart, you know, application, you don't want to generate the same page again and again for thousands of users. You can just do it once and cache it and serve the cache to a lot of users. When also the time taken to compute or fetch the output is not acceptable. So even if the results are unique, but it takes five minutes to generate the page, then you might want to cache it, right? So. 
and the output uh, can say, stay consistent for a period of time. Uh, again, let's say for a shopping cart or shopping uh, website, the products page, they, those products, once added, they're going to stay there for a while. Right? Even if you're going to add a new product or you're just going to remove a new uh, a product, um, you could have the cache, uh, uh, you can have the old pages in the cache, uh, stay in the cache for probably about another hour before you change it, and that's fine. Yeah, because if a new product is added, it will not show up until an hour later. Not so bad, but if a, new, if a product is removed, right, it will still be in the cache, the user clicks on it and they don't want to buy it, you call your controller, your controller says, nope, product does not exist. Still not so bad. You can still control that kind of user uh, UX. When real-time accuracy of the output is not really required, yeah, you, 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 you can cache locations of uh, taxi uh, like long, that, that's fine, you can. Uh, but you shouldn't cache for an hour. I think five seconds, 10 seconds is fine. You know, 20 seconds is fine. Yeah? Um, someone ever told me that even caching for like 20 seconds, sometimes it's a big thing. If the number of uh, clients, connecting clients are high, as if you have 10,000 clients connecting, they all want the same number, right? Just caching for 20 seconds, 30 seconds, it helps a lot, yeah. Only a small part of the output will change if you have a huge web page or a huge data hash. Only like 10% or less than 5% will change. You can cache the whole thing, and then whenever there's a change, only modify that little bit and cache it again. So you actually work on the cache instead of like recomputing the entire uh, data hash. So, um, and especially when the output only changes at a predictable time. So uh, in an enterprise environment, there'll be a lot of uh, manual workflows, you know, people coming back with uh, lots of uh, invoices or whatever to key into the system. You know when the data will change, so you can cache it until then. And when an always ready copy of the del uh, data or the output uh, is required. So um, the data in your data store can change or your database can change, but you always need a ready copy to render a page, to send an email or whatever. Yeah? And when it's more cost effective. So you can actually cache compiled bytecode. That's uh, even in PHP, you can do that. Uh, that's the uh, ops code you can comp uh, cache. You can cache database query results, HTML output, fragments. You can cache the return of a JSON API. You can cache um, user session data, using preferences as well. Uh, but you can cache it on the, on, on the browser if you want to. Um, arrays, hashes, transient data that isn't too permanent. So. There are like many layers uh, uh, in your infrastructure that you can apply caching, but um, a good number of us are very familiar with web caching uh, at the edge level, like Cloudflare, Cloudfront, your CDNs and all. Um, but but uh, I'm actually talking about the application layer within around PHP. Yeah. So. So when you write a lot of stuff to, to the cache, right? let's say memcache, redis, or dynamodb, um, especially for memcache, you can have expiry timestamp, so they actually expire after an hour, so you don't have to clean up, you don't have to remember to clean it up after an hour or a day, it will just go away by itself. Um, memcache also re redu uh, removes item based on a least, use, uh, least recently used, and menu, you can actually call the key and say, hey, unset the thing. So applications can actually cache and forget. You can just keep caching stuff. You know, don't have to worry about it. If it's not used, it'll just go away. Yeah. yeah. If a, if a new key comes along, um, if you use a if you use timestamp as a key, right, the new one will be used. The old one will be forgotten. That's fine. You know. So, cache busting is a technique where you augment the key to get a new copy of the set of the data. So a very good example is that you actually cache a URL, right? And then, so the full URL is cached. However, time, however many times you hit the same URL, it's going to get this cache data. But you know the database has changed, the values in the database have changed, and if you're going to call the controller now, a new page should be rendered. So you can actually augment the URL 
uh, by putting a, a very safe thing like a uh, question mark t equals 1, t equals 10. Right? That will change the key and then that will hit the controller and return a new page. That's for, probably for testing for development purposes you can do that. Yeah. Right, to get a live version of the output. Cache invalidation refers to the fact that you want to remove the items in cache. Um, there are times where the, um, the data in the database can stay for a long time. Let's say a, 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 um, a customer list. You know, so you have like hundreds of thousands uh, customer or million customer in a database. So what you did is that you actually do a map reduce, you pull out all the names, based on postal code, you create this hash, and you cache it, right? It's not going to change so often, right? Maybe every week you're just going to add a few, one or two, but you do not know when, right? Sometimes maybe there's no addition. Sometimes there'll be a lot. So you, you're going to cache for a long time. You can cache it for a month or a year. Who cares? But you know when it's going to change. So when it, when it changes, just invalidate the cache and refresh it again. And you can do that by the key. Um, certain caching or, or uh, 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 solutions allows you to flush items older than a certain date. So you just keep the last two weeks, if that makes sense to you, depending on the application. Or in the, in the uh, case of Cloudflare, you can actually say, hey, you know what? All these pages have cached for me. Everything under slash customers, remove them. They're no longer, uh, uh, they're no longer valid. OK, so for an e-commerce website, for example, you can actually cache all the public pages because they're the same for all users, thousands and hundreds of thousands of users. They're the same, right? Um, in addition to that, you can actually cache every product item uh, fragment. So a web page could have like could show like 20 products, right? Each of them could be a fragment, and you can cache every one of them. So if one product description has changed, you only update that product fragment. Right, so and then you invalidate the, the, the top cache. The top cache can now reconstruct everything, but it'll be quick because it takes all the fragments and assemble a new cache. Right, so it'll be very very fast. It doesn't have to re-render the entire page. But private pages, you will not cache them. You just leave them out of the uh, 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 cache, and then it will not be cached. You'll be uh, generated dynamically. The same goes for a social media website. It's very similar. You have the content page, um, say a blog page, right? A, a blog post. The content of the blog, once written, not going to change too much. You can cache it, and then the, the comment section could have multiple comments, right? The entire comment section could be one cache. You can cache that as well, right? Those are fragments, right? The page cache will be will be basically the blog post cache fragment and a comments fragment. So when the comments have changed, a new comment comes in. You take the comments fragment, you append it with the new comment and then you refresh the command fragment. And then you refresh the page fragment using, sorry, the page cache using the uh, content fragment and the, the uh, comments fragment. Yeah, it'll be way, way faster than just rendering the whole uh, page. So some of this, these are some of the, um, oh, sorry, let me go back. Uh, okay. Da, da. Yeah, these are some of the um, common app behaviors per se, right? These are in the nature. You, you have like uh, high write volume, high read volume, right? Normally, in that case, the real time uh, accuracy is not so important. Uh, Facebook like counts, those are, yeah. It, actually, Facebook like counts are not exactly the same across all um, devices, they are off by usually quite a bit, right? And after they reach like a thousand, they put one k, so they can be off by quite a bit. Doesn't really matter, yeah. Um, but they are eventually consistent. Eventually, low write volume, high read volume. Those are like web pages, yeah. Um, high write, uh, sorry, write in real time, but read later, like analytics. You track all the analytics trackers, 
and you have a um, write in real time and read in real time, that's really hard to cache, right? Um, like chat messages, that's really hard to cache. And then you can write in batch and read in chunks. Lastly, I'm going to cover some of the, the, um, the myths that uh, it is not possible to cache a page because the usernames are different for each user. Say I'm, I'm on a shopping cart again, right? Okay, so I log in to one of these shopping websites, and on the top right-hand corner, I have my username, right? Just because I have my own username on the top, it does not mean I cannot cache the entire page. I can. I can cache the page without the username. I can save the username on a cookie on, in the browser, so that when the, um, the, uh, the page is loaded, the cache page is loaded, JavaScript kicks in, checks the cookie, and write the username on the top right-hand corner, right? Of course, you can say that the user can change the cookie store and whatever, but that's fine because it's not going to change, it's not going to really hack your system. It's just display, right? So that's fine. Um, and the session key will still apply to a cache page, so that's fine. It's not possible to cache the page because the section of the page is dynamic. Like I mentioned before, you can actually have fragments. So if a single fragment has changed, you can still reconstruct the entire uh, uh, page cache using fragments. Um, not possible to cache the results of AJAX call. Dependent, dependent on the nature of AJAX call. If the result is always about the same, that's fine. AJAX call is just a text file. You can actually cache that using memcache, Redis even. Um, Caching is bad because it leads to stale data or HTML. Yes, unless you put in some uh, cache invalidation uh, rules. Caching should be avoided because you can always tune your code for better performance. I have heard this time and again. Don't cache at all. Write real good code. Make it fast, right? If, if, if Ruby slow, switch to Golang. If Golang slow, switch to Scala, well, <laughs> well, I would say use the best tool for the job. In this case, if it's a static HTML for millions of users, use a high I/O you know, solution like Memcache. I think it's fine. You know, Varnish. I think it's fine. You know, don't render the page over and over again. Sorry. Right. So that's really a myth. Yeah. I think uh, this is the last one. Caching is good for read operations. Uh, that's also quite common, common uh, thinking that you only cache stuff that you read. Actually, not true. You can actually use a high-speed data store. Remember, cache is a high-speed data store for fast writes. All Facebook likes are actually stored in memory first. They're never stored on disk. They never, when you like a Facebook article, a like, it doesn't write to DB directly. Right? It gets written to a high-speed memory. And periodically, there's a, a routine that will read the high-speed memory collects it and write to a, a disk. Yeah. Facebook will crawl if they write to DB every time when you like an article. Yeah, so they don't. Yeah, if you need high-speed writes, caching is also good. You need a good, um, a, a fast data store like Redis, DynamoDB, they are pretty fast. They are fast because they are using SSDs, um, also because they're non-blocking. So they return immediately after the write. So, okay. Any questions? Was I like too is, fast? Is Sorry. there any particular caching service? I mean, obviously, you yes. get like a, a caching service, right? Is there any particular one that you could recommend? Um, for page caches, right? Web page caches, you can use uh, Cloudflare. That's pretty okay. Cloudflare. Cloudflare. Uh, it gives you free SSL as well. Uh, if you pay a little bit, they give you free DDoS protection. That's also pretty good. Um, if you want to host your own, you could run Varnish, I guess. Or uh, memcached, right? Those are fine as well. Yes. Yeah, also, uh, not too much extent to do uh, um, on the browser. Uh, you can cache uh, the HTTP server, so uh, the browser. The <coughs> oh yes, yes. What I did not cover was basically HTTP headers, right? You can actually set the headers to tell the browser not to retrieve the page again. Yes, that's also a good technique. Yeah, you could do that as well. Yes. Uh, not the last one. Don't before that. Before that? Yeah. Uh, caching should be avoided because you can code for better performance. I had uh, a story mm -hmm. before I came to my last company. Okay. They 
um, was uh, six years. They they uh, they um, uh, um, installed Mapcache, and uh, all, uh, all, all all was so faster, but uh, the code base uh, uh, become worse. Than right. So if if you abuse the cache, right? Yeah, it's, it can be it can lead to abuse. So developers don't write really performant code and just cache everything, right? So um, for a certain nature of apps where they generate very static pages, the developer can get away from that. But when you have, um, say, like Netflix, the, the, the dashboard, your, 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 your video dashboard on Netflix or channel dashboard on Netflix differs from user to user. So they can't cache one and serve thousands, right? Yeah. The best you can do in that scenario is that knowing every user has a different dashboard, every night or every hour, you look at their preferences in DB, hit the cache, sorry, uh, you refresh the cache by running your code, construct it before even the user retrieves the dashboard. So the, by the time they do it, it's immediate. They, they'll get it like, yeah, yeah. So, uh, but yeah, it's true. You can actually abuse, <laughs> yeah. Um, but so, so it's like both extremes, right? So you don't want to abuse it. At the same time, you don't want to rely 100% on, on, on code. Yeah. But because of that, my boss uh, thought that the... They the remove cash altogether. Uh, <laughs> was the best uh, personality that... Uh, wow. So, <laughs> so when I come, uh, I, 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 I come to do better. Yeah, so, so the, the um, I, I would say this. In the ideal world, you write 100% performant code. But to achieve the last 10% performance takes probably 90% of the time. So what costs, at what cost, right? Are server costs more expensive than engineer costs? I, I don't think so. So if you were to turn on the cache and leave the last 10% tuning, right, I would know, and avoid the last ten percent tuning. You probably save a lot more money, yeah, running your infrastructure than, than paying salaries to engineers. And um, uh, more often than not, there are uh, more cutting edge platforms or programming languages that promises really, really good performance, right? Uh, at the expense of lesser features and no TDD, no BDD, no no testing suites. So the developer could do a hello world that's freaking fast. But then, when it comes to really complex business logic, they just could not finish the code, could not uh, deliver the code, right? So, yeah, so it's more of a balancing act here. Use a tool that you're very comfortable with that is more or less 80%, 90% performant. Leave the last 20% to caching. I think that's fine, so long as the nature of the app suits caching, right? Like I said just now, chatting apps are very tough to do so because the, the, the message comes in, you need to broadcast immediately. You might write it to DynamoDB very quickly, then broadcast it, right? But mm, you don't really need to cache it because you have to push it out almost immediately. So you only so-called cache it, not really cache. In fact, you can use DynamoDB as your uh, persistent layer, uh, just in case if the server dies and boots up again. But then if you have a very good redundancy uh, uh, infrastructure, the other server will pick it up and just send it out. Yeah. So. So nature of apps, yeah, the, the developer has to look at the nature of apps and pick the correct catching strategy. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? Oh, yes. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, yes. Let me take this out. <coughs> So Sam has covered the principles behind uh, uh, caching. So I'll just be touching a little bit on the different tools that we would use as a PHP developer for, uh, as a PHP developer, right? So, uh, let's see, okay. Yeah, so according to the PHP the right way, they talk about opcode caching. So what Sam talked about bytecode byte, byte caching is basically what we in the PHP world use called opcode caching. There are a lot of libraries out there. So one of, uh, there's already available for PHP. So OP cache, for example, is the latest one. And it basically comes packaged together with PHP 5.5 onwards. So if you're already using that, you can turn on that, mod turn on that module. It's a core module in, in PHP. Uh, it's available from 5.5 up, upwards. I think 
is, is uh, also lower versions, uh, available in lower versions of PHP. Before that, it was APC, which is called alternate, uh, alternate P, uh, PHP cache. And before that, there's X, X cache and Zen optimizer and a few others. There's a whole bunch of them out there. So this is usually a module where you choose one, you just, just switch it on and it should work. Uh, try not to mix them together because you get some weird results. They have opcode cache of an opcode cache, which is kind of weird. Yeah. So an example of this doing uh, of doing this, uh, I can show you a quick example which I wrote in. You look at the uh, sample code, which uh, the sample code repo. There's a new folder there called caching. Inside there, I have a small little Docker file which has uh, which has some of the codes I'm talking about. Right. So I'll show you right now one of the examples. Uh, so here I have a doc. I have a Docker. In, doc, I have a Docker instance set, uh, installed. It's running uh, PHP 5.6. 2.24 as an Apache app and this is the app it's basically just showing you the uh, PHP info I can show you the page right now which is this right so over here if I look for op, op, op cache there's no uh, there's no mention of it in the module which, which means it's not it's not turned on and if I change this now to just hello world so one way we kind of like play around with uh, to, to measure how much we have uh, we have improved is by actually to know how much we have actually improved the performance using caching. We use uh, tools to measure it. For example, we use Apache Bench over here. So we use Apache Bench right now. Uh, basically, what he's doing is take ten concurrent connections hitting the server five thousand times, right? So it's basically hitting port eight thousand, which is the app, where the app is, and this is usually. It's without caching. It's without opcode caching. Let's look at the let's look at the performance, right? It's hitting with five. It's showing you five hundred five hundred every five hundred requests. It goes through. It shows you, right? So on average, it takes about twenty seven milliseconds. Fifty percent of them, longest request took about one hundred forty eight milliseconds. This is without opcode caching, right? Uh, so right now, let's turn on opcode caching by rebuilding. Uh, let's rebuild the Docker container. With opcode, uh, op op code turn on, op cache rather. Live demo, please work. Seems to work. Okay. Uh, right. Let's just prime. Let's just have a look at it again. Just it's just showing nothing but just hello world, right? So the same code. I'm gonna run the test again. So notice it takes about twelve, twenty-seven milliseconds on average. Maximum is one forty-eight. If I run this same test again. Look at the improvements, wow. right? It's about ten milliseconds faster, which means your page loads a bit faster. This is you know, this the, this example is a bit contrived because it's just showing one line of PHP code, but it's still cached. And, it, and it look at the performance is almost a two x, almost a two x performance, right? Um, yeah, it's close to two x performance in terms of this. So imagine what I could do for your for a bigger for a bigger application, right? Um, so that's the oh, that's opcode op, op, op caching. Uh, and another, another thing we could do is using uh, object caching. So object caching would be things like a a class, or an array, or or a value that we want to store somewhere in the server, and we want to retrieve it only when we and we retrieve when we store it somewhere, and we don't so we don't need to compute it again. For example, you do a SQL query, uh, which gives you uh, like fifty records. And you notice 50 records doesn't change. You can actually cache that entire set, that entire array into, into uh, you can serialize it and store it into a cache like Redis, memcache, and then retrieve it without recomputing or without making any more round trips to the, to the database server, which could improve the performance of, of your application. So there are things like APC has, uh, has an API for you to actually add stuff. So these are all in memory. In memory caches, you can just store in your. If you have uh, many instances of uh, PHP running, uh, when you use APC, it actually stores it locally in the memory. But if you have a cluster of servers that you need to share, you need to share data. You can use memcache. So with memcache, you can actually store stuff like uh, like a bunch of your, a cluster of your web servers, PHP web servers, could be storing stuff together in a one in a single memcache instance or, or a cluster of memcache instances. 
which we can then uh, share the same data. So like the same uh, first time a record was hit, like say uh, a, a, a first page of your of your of your blog post, five records was retrieved from the database. It's it, it won't change the next half an hour or so. You can actually store that five record in to Redis, and then when other clusters, other servers in your in your cluster picks it up, or uh, or rather retrieves the same thing, it finds it and you can actually just show. Uh, the records without making another uh, round trip to the database, right? So we could use this quite readily. I have a small little example of how it could be done. So in memcache.php, for example, so basically it's doing thing is basically adding a server. You can actually add multiple servers. So you have a cluster of like two, three memcache uh, servers. You can actually add all together here. Uh, basically, you check whether the key exists. If the key doesn't exist. Uh, which means it's not been stored in, a, in memcache yet. I can actually do a set with the data. And after that, it will be saved, and I don't have to. And basically, it will be showing you the saved data instead of the memcache data. So this is really uh, so you can actually wrap this up into uh, a class. So it's, uh, instead of making a calls, like so, you can have an abstraction layer which you say I want a record of this now. But if the record is not there, set this as a, a default value, for example. And then your abstraction class could actually do the handling of checking whether the value is there, storing it, then returning it, or if it's already there, I'll just retrieve it and show it, show it to you. You can actually write that abstraction layer on your, on your own. So this is one way of handling that. Um, we could also use the same principle of object caching when it comes to, uh, when it comes to uh, fragments. Fragments of your web page, for example, your Laravel app, you can actually cache the rendered version of that piece of code, like say the, the in the view of your blog post, for example, the first five blog posts has won't change in the next in the next two hours. You can actually cache the rendered HTML version of that page into into memory. So a lot of uh, uh, frameworks like Laravel, Cake PHP, they actually they actually have this built into the system. And in this case, is actually a lot, this is a lot of, uh, a, a add-on. It's called Matroska. So it's a caching framework which you can use to basically uh, cache fragments, uh, rendered fragments, right? So it's a really interesting one. And in most in most uh, frameworks like Laravel or Cake PHP, they, they actually have a, have they have actually introduced a a, a uh, their own abstraction layer which lets you work with different type types of backend of cache of uh, key value stores like memcache, Redis, and a few others. So this example of Laravel, uh, you can actually uh, you can actually store and retrieve stuff from uh, from either a database, a memcache cluster, or a Redis cluster. So you can actually store stuff that you don't have to worry about. Oh, do I have to know how to actually write stuff that interacts with the memcache server, or do I have to write stuff that interacts with the Redis server? You don't have to worry about that because the framework will actually abstract away that complexity. And just show it have one common interface which lets you interact with different types of backends, right? This is an example of caching done in uh, Cake PHP, right? So it's, it's, you echo the element and you actually cache it. You can also specify uh, the key that you use that you cache this with, uh, and you can also specify the expiry time, like how long this cache will, will remain there, right? So what Sam talked about in terms of cache invalidation. Uh, it could either be a time-based cache invalidation, so it will expire, or it could be key-based. Basically, your keys will, will you, you can embed certain values in, in the in, in in your cache key. So if there, something has changed in the content, for example, the rendered version of the code will have a certain MD5 hash. You can actually use that and store that, uh, make that your key. Right? That's one example of doing it. Uh, you'll be using something like Redis. You could, you could even do like uh, a nested uh, in Redis, you can do nested values. So if you, if a if your, in your the way that you, you write your cache keys, if you, if you actually invalidate a whole bunch of you, you could invalidate a whole bunch of IDs that comes after a slash user slash user five blocks whatever whatever all that is cache invalidated. In if you're using Redis, you can actually delete the entire block of 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 of, of, of keys by just doing a, a something like a star, right? You can. Yeah, there's, there's some command you can push, you can throw in and say anything that uh, have a certain pattern, you can, remo can remove all those caches, all those values in the, in the cache, which is kind of cool. Um, 
but that also of course requires you to learn know how to interact with the Redis server directly, which is yeah, one way. Um, right, so that's actually basically all there is to caching. I think we cover at most everything, right? Is there any any questions with regards to what Sam has talked about and what I've talked about? Yes. Which is why if you work with an abstraction layer, use yeah, use a framework like uh, Laravel has a fr uh, Laravel has a, they have a generic cache class. So what you use behind it is uh, is is basically up to up to you to decide. So if you're using a mem cache cluster, if the library changes, you you will basically just uh, the framework should handle that change for you, right? So you will switch from a mem cache cluster to uh, Redis cluster for. Uh, for your for key value uh, caching, you just need to swap around, change the credentials, change the server IPs, you know, and you basically tell it, "I'm using Redis now." That, that's it. It should handle all that difference for you, right? You use yes. So I think, uh, <coughs> what he means is like previously ABC is right, uh, right. Uh, is caching for BB five and four. Right. Then from BB five and five, ABC is duplicated and it's started using. Yeah. So what he what I think what his concern is like uh, is there much change in the code in order to I think APC APC and opcache no change is there is base is okay. APC has a key value uh, uh has a key, has a key value of the object caching yes. uh, component and it also has the opcode caching component. Yes. Op opcache doesn't have a does not have a key a object caching, but it's still it's still just a opcode caching. So it's just basically replacing one extension with another extension. What it does underneath, I think, is pretty similar. I don't think it should be any difference in uh, just go with the what is the most latest and most supported. Why they change? I think it's a political issue, which I don't want to get into. So <laughs> you know, so yeah. Anyway, yeah. Yes. Uh, do you know uh, if uh, OPCAT or some optimizer uh, run on the same process as uh, the PHP script? Because MapCache is uh, run as a service, so yeah. so it's a it's a Kubernetes. Right. Sometimes we we need a memory cache. Right. So yeah. Don't you know, I I wrote my proper memory cache, but uh, uh, with OPCAT or the yeah. So, 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 so I think your question is that uh, um, usually the map cache is not the same container, right? Yeah. So there's still a net network latency, right? Yeah. yeah. And um, here's the thing. The thing is that uh, the DB usually is also out of pro out of a container, right? It's a process out of container. So there's also a disk and network latency as well. So given that map cache is faster, however, having said that. For a specific nature of application, I would even recommend a second memcache within the same container of your app. It can be recommended if the nature allows. Uh, as in, for whatever reason, you need the cache, super high speed cache that's only for this instance of the web server. But that's why. Why not the uh, the memory cache, uh, our own memory cache? Right. Uh, <coughs> you mean within? Uh, oh, you can. So, 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 so time in an algorithm, we. Right, right. So it, 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 sorry, mm. it, it is. But uh, a, a separate uh, memcache container means it can be shared across all web workers. Yeah, so that you have that advantage. Yeah. Mm. In, in a previous company I worked in, we actually used Xcache to download a giant array. So this is there's a, there's, there's a an associative array which has feature feature toggles. Our feature toggles is stored as a giant array. It's actually, we have a database table with which is basically. Uh, of a bunch of feature feature toggles, and what we did was we export, we basically retrieve that as a as an associative array, and we store the associative array in memory using Xcache. Yeah, but in S RAM memory or 
Uh, ROM. ROM. It's basically RAM. RAM. Basically mem RAM memory. Yeah. So. Either way, if you put it in your app process, it's memory. MEM cache is also memory. Yeah. yeah. It's actually the same. So, so uh, um, yeah. Yeah. In fact, there is this technique about RAM disk that I'm not going into. That if you really want this, but fast, yeah. as fast as RAM, you can use RAM disk fast. <laughs> we. <laughs> really what you need. Yeah. Many years ago, I used to write. Uh, <laughs> Uh, many years ago, years ago, I used to write a um, a social network, and we had an inbox, and we use Couchbase as the inbox. So whenever things go wrong, we had to restart the Couchbase database or something. Data goes goes missing, or which things become inconsistent very fast. So don't if key value key value stores like Couchbase, Redis, they are fine and good as a caching layer. But don't use them as a primary primary data store. Always have an authoritative data store like MySQL or Mongo to a certain extent, but I wouldn't recommend it. But go for something which is properly asset, yeah. right? Like Postgres, MySQL, right, or MariaDB. Yeah, uh, that's a, as an authoritative store, and then you have a cache layer in front of it, either yeah. as a transient, yeah, it's just transient data in uh, memcache, Redis, or something which you can just read very quickly which things that don't require you to do a lot of computation. Like for example, a home feed. A home feed for, for Facebook whatever requires a lot of computation to, to gather up the data and what, find out what's going on inside. That computation takes a lot of time. And, it, and you, if you have to do that, that computation every time some person loads a home page, it's not practical, right? So you cache things, for example. Right? So we cache things in Redis, we cache things in memcache, you cache, cache things in local memory or as a file somewhere. It can be done. Right? There's, some there's some partial, there's some uh, view caching that actually takes a rendered version of the, of, the, of the view and she stores it as a temp file in the, in, in the file system. They do that. can be done. Yeah. Cool. Any other questions? All right. So that's it. We're coming to the end of the PHP the right way workshop. Thank you very much. Um,